Good morning, New Day family. Let's stand and let's begin our worship this morning. family and guests. What a wonderful I'm sorry. Good morning. If you are a guest this morning, we want to make sure that you feel welcome. Please um, spend some time with us as, after we close. We want to get to fellowship with you, possibly help you out, fill out by filling out a connection card. We want to make sure we are able to contact you so we can serve you in the best way possible. We also want to pray for you, whatever needs you might have, whatever cares and concerns that you may have, you're in the right place. Here we have people who are dedicated in serving others, but also being that, that vessel of comfort. So please uh, plan to spend some time with us afterwards. 
Uh, the men today are going to be going to Salt Lake Barbecue. If you haven't uh, made plans already, please uh, just join us. We've got plenty of rides over there. Uh, with that being said, um, today is a great day. What I mean by that is this. It's sunny outside. We're all together as a family. And every day is a gift from God. And it's because of the Lord's unfailing love that we are able to survive, but also live a life that is full of blessing because we belong to the living God. And so with that being said, it's just happy. It's happy for me to be with you all. I miss y'all being out of the way, out of the loop for a little bit. But we just want to make sure that we are always here for you in the best way possible. With that being said, uh, let's open up in prayer. Let's honor God and ask for his leadership this morning. And almighty God and Father, we thank you so very much, Lord, just for who you are and everything that we have in you. It is because of your faithfulness, Lord, that we're able to live a life in this world, a life full of bless blessing, a life full of prosperity, not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of a holy and righteous God who loves us, who has a special plan and purpose for each and every one of us. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for being the God of our victories, the God of our accomplishments, the God of our blessings, but also Lord, you're the God of our defeats. You're the God of our failures. I say this because you never leave us nor forsake us. You never fail us, but many times we fail you but you never abandon us. You always pick us up. You always forgive us. You always show us mercy. But oh God, let it be, today be the day that we praise you and thank you and draw closer to you and grow in our faith in you. Father, we give you our burdens. We give you our cares, but also we give you the joy of our heart. Because, Lord, at the very center of our innermost being, you are there. So we worship you, O oh God, in spirit and in truth. We pray, dear God, that you eliminate any distractions we may have so that we can completely hear from you and that we can be one with you. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
Father, we praise you, Lord, for you are worthy. Now help our minds and our hearts to be still. Anything that the enemy would do to distract us or plague us from this time, that we would just cast it aside. 
maybe the hurts and the pains and the aches from this week or this month or maybe 2023. God, that we would find peace and wholeness in you. And let us be encouraged through the preaching of your word. That your spirit will lift us up. Because you are here. You promised you would never leave us nor forsake us. So God, I thank you that we don't have to usher you in and make ourselves worthy or make ourselves noticed or make ourselves heard. For you never stop watching. So we love you. We praise you. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 You all may be seated. It is great to worship with everybody today. Again, welcome to New Day Church. We're going to continue our Meals with Jesus conversation. This is his last meal in the book of Luke. So it's going to be broken down in a couple of weeks. So if you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6 in your phone, tablet, Bible, whatever you're comfortable using. Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6. Now we're going to pause for a big portion of this. Um, this is going to be a little different than what we normally do. Uh, as far as we usually go through Scripture, we exegete the Scripture, and then we move on. Uh, I want us to talk about what the Passover meal has been like for centuries and millennia. Because once you can see the Seder, that's what you've heard it's called, um, which just means the procedure, the schedule in which they do Passover, you can see the, the story of the Christ unfolding throughout millennia, but then you see how Jesus is breaking this meal down. And what it means for you and I today, like this isn't just an ancient Hebrew thing that has no relevance to you and I today. We can see how God still moves. And so this was a time of, of intense uh, uh, hospitality, right? Everyone would be garnered in for the Passover meal. That's what's going on in our story. And this was also an oral culture, an oral tradition. That means they didn't read a lot as far as the Passover goes. Like, this was all about how I shared it. There's a lot of flair. There's a lot of drama, right? And it was one of the things I love. You spend any time around Jewish people, during their worships and during these kind of things, there's a lot going on. There's music. There's dancing. This is, there's a flair for the dramatic. That solemnity that a lot of us have before Christ. I'm not saying that's bad. But they have this joy because they know of what God has done, and that's where this comes from. So let's read with me Luke 22, verses 1 through 6. So now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him, him being Jesus, to death. For they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was the number of the twelve. And he went away and he conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad, and they agreed to give him money. So he consented, and he sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread drawn near, that is the Passover, which will be the focus of the day, but there's an event that's really important that happens before Passover in the life of Jesus, and it's the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. See, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death. Uh, we spent a couple of weeks talking about how um, he ruffled some religious elite's feathers based on how, what he told them, how he conducted himself. But in the bigger part of Jesus' ministry, he was trying to bring people to a real relationship with God, not to rules. And that's what the Pharisees, scribes, and lawyers were trying to do. And not only were they trying to give them rules, they were giving them made-up rules. Right? Jesus didn't come so that people would break the law. He came to free them from these traditions and keep the law. Right? He says not one job or till the law will ever pass away. But his popularity with the religious elites waned. And no longer was he even seen as a rabbi. He was seen as someone dangerous. Like, you got to understand, popularity is not all it's cracked up to be. There's been people who love you when you're in center stage. And with the, with the love and the care those people have... You will have the opposite as well. There will be people who hate you vehemently because you have a spotlight, because you have a stage. Now, many of us may not be on TV or on the radio, or is the radio even a thing anymore? You may not have a podcast, you may be on Spotify and YouTube, but you're going to have people in your life, family members, in your job, where you get a spotlight, where you get a moment where you know, you, you've, you've done something of recognition. Don't expect everyone to just love you in that moment. 
because it's not going to happen. Now, that's when you get to learn, hey, these are the people who really are there for me, and then there's those guys over there. But this wasn't, we just don't like Jesus. They wanted him dead. In Luke chapter 6, I think it says this in a very interesting way. Jesus says, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, especially evil people. So there comes a moment where we, if there's a certain kind of person who loves me, and they are reputably evil people, I may need to work that out. Right? If I can be loved by evil people, then I may be projecting something, I may be doing something that I need to have a heart check on. Right? Now, if people who love the Lord are rejoicing and they're for you, this is saying, great, that's, that's wonderful. But I should be living in such a way that evil people are like, oh, that person. I don't want to be around that person. Not because we are being unloving or uncaring or unwelcoming, but the light inside of us exposes the darkness inside of them. And so it's not us they're angry at, it's the light of Christ. And so that means if I can be mixed in and there's not something different, I need to judge that. I need to see God, what's going on. And so we also need to know following Jesus can be very dangerous. Because being Jesus was very dangerous. And I think this is, a, this is an interesting thing. It says, then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot. Now, Judas Iscariot, that is our anglicized way of saying his name. His name would have been Yehuda of the city. That's what Iscariot means. Now, that doesn't mean anything other than he was probably from some town that wasn't all that popular. So he was just Judas from that place over there. Right, this is a very common name. Yehuda was a normal name. That's Judah in the Old Testament. Right, this is a common name. We actually see one of the brothers of Jesus has the same name. Jew, Judas, there was an overlap. But here's what Judah means. It literally means to give praise during a state of awe. It means like when you're at the Grand Canyon, you go, wow, look at what God has done. That's Yehuda. Wow, look at what God is doing. And now you have this man who is supposed to be the outstretched praise of God, literally being entered in with the devil and betraying one of his best friends. The Satan, Satan enters in. This is really important. That means there's a couple of things going on in the life of Judas. Number one, Judas was living in such a way that his heart was open to such a thing. Like this wasn't just a thing that, that God made happen. Judas had been living in a way that entered, opened up his heart to be taken over by the devil. Right? And we see this because Jesus says, I kept all who are mine. In other words, I'm not going to let the devil take anybody. We're actually going to see a little bit more of that particular statement play out over this meal in later weeks. And so what this thing is, Judas was never mine. He tried to be a part of our group, but we see through other parts of Scripture, Judas was stealing, he was conniving. And you can take a couple of ways to look at this. You can take a very a negative approach to Judas. Again, this is speculation, but I think it's helpful. The negative approach is from the, from the beginning, Judas was always just trying to get an upper hand and Jesus was the easiest way to do so. Right? He was just the easiest way to do so. Or, if you have a more charitable approach, Judas really believed in Jesus the revolutionary. Because that's what people wanted desperately. And just maybe, if I push Jesus enough, he'll just snap into God mode. And he'll just make the salvation of Israel happen. That's exactly what does occur, just not in the way Judas foresaw. But it, Jesus illustrates kind of how this whole thing works. He says, look, those who are mine aren't mine. Right? And so there's a moment in his ministry where he casts out a demon, and the Pharisees say, well, it's the name of Beelzebub you do this. And he goes, a house divided against itself cannot stand. He goes, why would I work for the devil and work against what he's trying to do? That doesn't make any sense. He says, look, if somebody wants to enter a house, they have to go through the strong man of the house first. And if they can tie up the strong man, they can take the home. His point being is, I belong to God, and those who belong to God have a strong man inside of them called the Holy Spirit. And if a demon thinks he can just walk in and do what he wants, he is sorely mistaken. Because he's got to get through God first. So he's saying Judas didn't have that hand of protection, didn't have... That claim. And so he went and he betrayed Judas, and he betrayed Jesus to the chief priests and officers. 
Now keep in mind, if you want to look at this, it was a highly communal event. Jesus should have been in the marketplace for this. He should have been in the temple. He should have been in the synagogue. He should have been allowed to worship freely. This was the big day. This was Passover. And because of his relationship, he's in an upper room, hidden, cloistered away. Basically, no one knows he's there. Right? He had a triumphal entry where everyone knew Jesus entered the town. But once he appeared into the town, he was gone. So who knows? Only the twelve. And so one of those twelve, being Judas, goes to betray him. Jesus' last meal was that of betrayal. This is a real thing. This, this happens. People we love can betray us. And that can look in different ways. That can look in different, that, that can work itself out differently. But you can't judge success so easily. Because if you look at the life of Jesus, for many of us, he would not really be counted as all that successful. Twelve guys is all he had at the end of his ministry. And one of them is so wicked he betrays him. A lot of us have had a lot more quote-unquote success in the world's eyes than Jesus ever did. But in the kingdom of the economy of God, no one will ever do more for humanity than Jesus. So we have to find solace in walking with God. That I find my meaning and my purpose in who he is, not in just the things I do. So with that said, I want us to pivot here to talk about the Passover Seder. Because it really highlights what begins to happen next in the meal. We're not, we're not going to go over any more of those verses in the book of Luke. So I'll ask you to just listen. We're going to have a picture up here. And it's of the Seder plate. And so when you went to Passover, most likely, as far as even historians can tell, this was still even what Jesus would have had thousands of years ago. Like this is a tradition that is millennia old. Because Jesus, his people have been practicing this for almost a thousand years at that point. Right? There's a lot of time that's been going on. And so these plates, some of them, have been passed down for generations. They're very ornate, very beautiful. You have a family plate that you have for Passover, if you were able to have one. And so there's something, I think, to be said for sacred items and sacred spaces. You know, when you go to a church that's like a cathedral, and you can see all that architecture, there's, you just can't help but go, wow. Now, God is here, God is with us, and I'm not saying that there's anything bad that what we do here is, is lesser. But there is something to be said for that kind of reserved space. So let's go through the, the, the plate and what they represent. You have the karpas, which is the, the parsley. All right, It symbolizes the hyssop that they put the blood of the sacrifice on the doorpost. Right? And so the Israelites um, did this during the 10th and most terrible plague. And it's to remind them the cost of their salvation. Right Now, keep in mind, in, in that book, in, in the Exodus, God gives a warning to Pharaoh. Moses tells him, Pharaoh, if you don't do this, your firstborn in all the land will die. And Pharaoh laughs at him. So he says, okay, we've given you your chance. Do you want to know how to fix it? And then God gives it that. He says, if you put blood above the doorpost, you'll be saved. Then you have the morar, that is the bitter herbs. Traditionally, this is horseradish or a mixture of horseradish and some other kind of bitter herb. It reminds us of the bitterness of slavery. Right? This was the part of the Seder plate um, that you would take because you wanted to remember the hard times. Remember what you've been delivered from. Which is then followed by the charo set. That was a combination of apples, nuts, spices, and a little bit of wine or grape juice. It was sweet. It was a dessert-like mixture. But its consistency was supposed to be that of a brick. To remind the Israelites of all the bricks they had to make back in Egypt. So if you get what this plate is trying to do in these first things, it's we're trying to dramatize that which God has done for God's people. But then was the Zorah. That's the lamb shank bone. That's the bone that's on there. No, no one ate it already. It's supposed to be bare. Right? It's already supposed to be there. And it's the symbol of sacrifice. The reason the Zorah is blank is because without the temple, there could be no sacrifices made. And it's to remember to dwell on the grace of God. Now keep in mind, this is not current Christianity we're talking about. This is ancient Judaism. So even they recognize the sacrificial system was insufficient. 
Because then next was the betzah, which was the brown roasted egg. It was to represent the daily sacrifices you were to make. And that sacrifice is required to be reconciled to God. To be reconciled to God. So then you have on your plates, you had matzah, which is the unleavened bread. They were put in a talit, which is a very special kind of, 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 of um, it was like what they would wear, the priests would wear over them, so like a shawl. And he would wrap the, the matzah in that. There would then be a big cup of salt water for the table to remind everybody of the bitterness and tears shed in their past. There would be a bowl for ceremonial washing. And then there would be grape juice, although traditionally it was wine, and four cups. So with that said, that's what the plate, that's what the setup would be. And so let's go over what the actual dinner would be. Because when Jesus begins to teach the sections we're going to, he's actually going to be teaching through the Seder meal. And there's parts of it that will pop up in here. So first there would be the four cups of wine set out before everybody. And, then, and when this is done, there's always somebody leading it. And this even happened in ancient times. So you, you would have the, the father, the grandfather, the, the head of the household, the head of the community, whoever was head of what was going on would have a separate table to demonstrate and everyone else would have their own um, at their tables. So then he would read Exodus chapter 6. Say therefore of the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out of the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. So that's what they would read. There was these I will statements made from God. And so you're saying, okay, Pastor, what does this have to do with us today? Don't worry, we're getting there. And so they would light the candles have a prayer, and they would take the first cup. Now the first cup was the cup of sanctification. That means the cup of being right before God. And you would drink the cup, and it signified that God would bring you out of the burdens of Egypt. Now again, this is metaphorical. They weren't just celebrating being delivered from Egypt at this time. What else does that bondage represent? That represents sin. And so the minute you would drink of the cup, you would then wash your hands. Then you would take the parsley from the plate, and you would dip it in the salt water, and you would eat it. And no, none of that is pleasant whatsoever. Right? You have, and it's supposed to be the bitterness and tears of my bondage. To remember that. And so for us today, that's saying, I need to remember the bitterness and pain of the sin I committed in my life. When I forget those things, I can be harsher on people because I forgot what it was like to be in their shoes. Because I too was redeemed by God once. So the question that this I will statement gives for every Hebrew, but for you and I today, is do I really believe that God can break the strongholds of sin in my life? That's the call. Do I really believe He can deliver me from my strongholds? Now strongholds can look a whole bunch of different ways. They could be addictions. They could just be sin I don't deal with. They could be broken relationships. I mean, this is a huge thing. There's a lot of things this could be. Now, the point of the bondage is these are things I either have gotten myself into or someone else has placed on me. It doesn't matter. And this is really tough because a lot of our bondage is sometimes self-inflicted, right? Some of our worst wounds, we did to ourselves. But that's not all of them. There's a lot of wounds people who should have been biologically programmed to love us, inflict upon us. People we're supposed to be in community with, inflict upon us. People who we trusted spiritually, inflict upon us. Things that maybe aren't just belittlement, but I mean severe things that you don't even know if the trauma can be overcome. But God's answer is the same to both. Do you believe I can deliver you? Like, do you believe I, the Lord, can intervene and make a difference? Because some of our wounds, we just don't want to let go of. Because we think, if I let go, if I don't hate this person who did this to me, then I'm giving them a pass. And really, we're not. We're letting go so we can be free and trusting God to be just, trusting God to be caring to us. That I can really be changed that God would turn us, as the scripture says in the New Testament, to a new creation. That, that's why I, I, if, if we're going to argue about some stuff in the world, I, I, this whole, am I born a certain way, this, that, that, that doesn't matter. 
what, what, what we're going to argue. It doesn't matter. Like, if you want to get into that argument, fine, that's your prerogative. Because if you look at it, like, we can be born with proclivities to alcoholism, right? You can show there's genetic, direct genetic links into our DNA of stuff that we inherit from our ancestors. That we can be born with sinful proclivities, sinful things that other people aren't born with. Which is why Jesus makes us a new creation. I am not just a clump of cells with no meaning. I am a person created by God. And I am renewed spiritually and through something different altogether. Amen. Something incorruptible that one day will dwell with God forever. I am not my past fallen self. I am not in the same bondage. The only reason I'm in bondage is I don't want to let go of the chains. Yeah. It's hard. I'm not here to fault anybody or to guilt anybody. It's hard. Change hurts. And especially when it's good change. Right? If you go to the gym and you don't hurt, that probably wasn't a good gym day. Right? If you diet and you don't lose weight, that's a bad diet. Right? Like that, 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 that diet stinks. But the diets who do well, all those things, they require a bit of sacrifice. They hurt. But you're better on the other side. And so this also reminds us when our old life tries to claw its way out of the grave. That's what it is, right? We were dead and now we're alive. And the old life is dead. We remember the tears shed before for us to be made new. Not just by us, but by God. By Christ. And so this is our missional community plug. We're off this week. Next week we're starting back up. We're going to be going over sanctification. What does it mean and look like to walk with God? And to grow in that process. So if you've not joined a group, would like to join a group, would like to host a group, let me know. And we'd love to plug you in. And so then they would ask four questions. Kids go around asking, why do we do this? And they basically, the response is because we want to remember God's deliverance. I'm not a big traditional person. And I think y'all have been in our church long enough to know tradition's not really our style. But I think there's something beautiful to be said for some of these ancient traditions that remind us of the goodness of God. And so there's, there is a place where we can say, well, if we do this for a reason. I think where tradition becomes a big issue is that what we're doing is what we do. And it's law. And we don't even know why. That's different. This is saying, hey, this is a rich thing and we remember the goodness of God. And so then they take the matzah. There's three matzah put in the titzla. And then they take one, break it and hide it. And then it's put in what's called an afikomen. And that gets hidden for something later. Afikomen literally means he who is to come. Three matzah put in, the middle one broken and hidden. This is ancient Judaism we're talking about here. We're not talking about modern Christianity. But can you see the spiritual parallel? The father, son, broken, hidden, and ransomed. So then they would drink the next cup, which is the cup of judgment, which is when God said, I will rescue you from your bondage. And here's what they would do. They would take their finger and before they would drink it, they put it in the wine and they would drip it on the table, one drop for every plague, because it came at great cost to their deliverance. Folks, this is just a reality, but it's true and it's something why we need to be grateful to God. My blessing takes away something from somebody else. If you get a promotion, someone didn't get promoted. And it's really easy for us to lose sight and be grateful that, hey, God gave me favor, and I'm not saying so you should never do anything because uh, that's not the way it works. What I'm saying is we need to be very grateful for what God does in our lives because what is a blessing to us costs someone somewhere something. And usually that person's God. And so they would remember this cost. And so then the question becomes, okay, if I can be delivered from my sin, can I be delivered from my physical bondage, my health issues, my, my, my job issues, my relational issues? Can God deliver me so that those are better? Right? And here's the thing. They recognize this. It was not plagues that set them free. It's not wine that set them free. It was the bloodshed of the perfect Lamb of God. And they even knew this back then, that the Messiah would make this right. And it's not just now the sins of other people, but the things I have done and the things around me can be made right. And here's what's really important. 
When God calls, as it says, none can come unto the Lord unless the Spirit draws him himself. We cannot assume there's another call coming. If God opens a place for us to go, if God calls us and we say no, guess what happened to every Israelite that did not believe Moses? They were stuck in Egypt. There was one call. And they said, when it's time to go, you got to go. And for what we know, most left. But could you imagine being like, well, I don't know. I don't know what's on the other side. I don't know what's out there. And that actually becomes one of their complaints a little later. So I'm just going to stay here in Egypt. At least I know it's a known quantity, right, where I am in slavery. If you stayed, I guarantee you weren't getting another chance. Which leads to the next part of the plate, which is the moror. This is that bitter herbs that have been added to the matzah. And it showed the bitterness of sin and slavery. And you were supposed to eat this till you cry. Now for me, one whiff would have been enough. I hate that stuff. You know, wasabi and horseradish, I, I can't, I can't do it. Right? If I just look at it enough, I'll probably start crying. For some of you, that may be a big chip. Right? But you did. You had to take enough horseradish to cry. That was the symbolism because it came at great pain. That it came at great hardship. That I was somewhere broken and I've been delivered. And he would immediately follow that with the charo set, which is the sweetness, which is the celebration that God kept his word. So the questions that we have when we look over the Passover is, do I trust that God will? Will I live as if it's true? Is the next part. So then you would eat the Passover meal. You'd have the afikomen, which was hidden. It was found and was ransomed. Right? You would then have to pay the leader of the Seder to then open it. So he could be let free. And again, this is ancient Judaism. I hope you're not missing the symbolism here. Because of Christ was hidden and ransomed for us, for our freedom. And then they would break that afikomen and two. And so when you look at communion, literally this was the moment that Jesus said, this is my body. I am the Mashiach. I am the fulfillment of this. I am the fulfillment of the cup of judgment broken for you. So every time they took Passover, every time they would do the Seder after this, they would drink the cup of judgment, and they remember it was broken on Jesus, not them. Then they would take the next cup, which is the cup of redemption. He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched hand. This is when they put the blood over the doorpost. And this is where they remember the shank that can no longer be spilled. And this is when Jesus drank the wine. He said, I know there's a system set up, and we've not been able to complete it because we have no temple. But my blood Will take its place. So when he tells us to drink in remembrance of him, what we're remembering is he took the sacrificial lamb's place for you and I. That we may be purified. That I am redeemed. And this is in, do I live as someone who's redeemed? Am I like one of those persons who's like the constant navel gazer? Where everything's bad all the time? Where nothing's good ever happening? Or am I somebody in Christ who is able to rise above those things and overcome those things? That God continually spurs me forward, filled with joy. Right? Joy is hard because joy means it doesn't matter my situation. Can I walk through the fire and believe He's going to be there next to me? Can I approach the great ocean and the, sea, the Red Sea and think, you know what? God still got this. Can I be in the wilderness for 40 years and think, God still has a plan for me? That's what this cup represents. Do I trust that he is able? And they would then set this aside for when the Messiah would come. Jesus didn't do that. 
he began to talk about how he's the fulfillment. And then they would read Psalm 113, which says, Praise the Lord, praise the servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated in heaven, who is far down from the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust, and He lifts the needy from the ash heap. And to make them sit with princes and the princes of his people. He gives the barren women a home. Making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. And so you'd have this time of remembrance. And then you rejoice. And Christians, that's where our strength comes from. It says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if I don't have joy, I have no spiritual strength. And so Satan's constantly trying to rob us of our joy, to be dissettled with our, with our relationships, be disgruntled with our jobs, to be disgruntled with our home, to be disgruntled with my health, to be disgruntled with my mental state, be disgruntled, disgruntled, disgruntled. Because if he can take my joy, he takes my strength. But when my joy is found in the Lord, no one can take that from me. They have a lot of power. They can take lots of things, but they can't take my joy. I can only give it away. Which leads to the fourth cup, which is the cup of praise. Saying, I will take you to be my people. And this was a covenant that Jesus is now going to make with the rest of the world. Jesus does not drink this cup yet. He says, I will drink of this cup with my father. I will see praise, not just for the people of Israel anymore, not just for Jews, but for every person on this planet who would be under my name. From all of time past to all of time future, for all of eternity, I'm going to make this thing called the church. The church is not a building, it's a people that spans all time and space. We are in church with all of the saints in heaven right now. We are in church with all of the saints that are around us. And yes, we're going to disagree on some pretty big things. This will be very ecumenical in heaven. This will be a whole lot of different ways of it, that we think that we had it all right. But it's all about Christ. But then there will be people who never knew Christ. Who played the game. Who said they were religious. Who said they were culturally this or that. We won't see them there. But Jesus said, I have come to build a people so that they would be mine and I would be their God. And the word that gets used in the New Testament for this is pas ethnos, every ethnicity, every tribe, every tongue, every people. Christianity is truly a world religion made for everyone to have a seat at the table with Jesus. And so we're going to end there because then we'll actually pick up the story as it comes. And I hope this helps you get illuminated. But we're going to do something a little different today. We, we, we usually have a time of prayer and it's about that time. But I'm going to ask for our prayer leaders to stand up. And instead of me just standing up here and, and praying, I'm going to ask for them to go. We have, we have spots. We'll have, we'll have Josh and Carly here at the Welcome Center. But we have folks set up to, to pray for different things. If you need to pray for your health, we're going to ask that you go pray with somebody. And we're, we're going to do this here in just a moment. But we, we have prayer partners out there that if you need someone to pray over your health, if you want to go to that first question, do I, or that third question, do I believe Jesus can deliver me? We ask that you go there. And that will be over here. Then we have our folks who say, hey, I, I, I want you to pray with somebody who can pray over your financial relationships, your, your hardships, those, those things that are going on. Saying, I need somebody to help stay in the gap for me to just be prayed for. That'll be over here in this group. Then if you need folks to just say, hey, look, I need someone to just be with me for, for relationship healing, for those things. We have someone to pray with you there. And if you just need someone to pray with you, you're like, look, I, I have a lot going on. I don't really want to say anything. We've got folks here who are willing to pray with you. But I want us to take a special emphasis on this because we spent time talking about the will do i trust that god will and the way we as people show that we are communing with god is we pray we pray i'm not forcing anybody 
But we're going to take a time to pray. And if you don't want to get up and pray with somebody, I ask that you just pray in your seats. That we take a time to corporately pray because there's so much going on in the life of our church. There is so much going on with sickness and health and jobs and relationships that we need to pray for each other. So I'm going to ask if, if maybe if you don't have something, but you know of somebody in our church that needs to be prayed for, go pray with somebody and pray for them. It's called interceding, that we'll stand in the gap for each other. And again, you may not be somebody who wants to pray out loud. That's fine. I just that maybe just go stand with somebody then. Just, just be present. Because everybody's got something. And I love the fact that we as a family can look and we, we're here. But there's only so much we in the flesh can do. And I believe with every ounce of my heart and being, with everything in my soul, God loves us, He hears us, He sees us, and He answers the prayers of His people. And I'm not trying to to guilt you into something, but I am going to say this. A lot of times we do this, and maybe you're thinking, yeah, I, I want to pray for somebody, but I, I really don't want to talk to somebody. I, I'm, I'm kind of an introvert. I, I don't really do that. I would ask that today, spend time praying with someone. Even if it's just silently. Just stand next to them and say, I'm going to pray for you. You know what you can look at them and say? Amen. It's okay. God hears that too. Right? And it's not about the words we use. It's just about, do I really believe, do I trust when God says, I will do these things, that God can and he will do them, that he can take broken things and restore them, that he can take these things that are precious to us and mend them. And I think the only way we can remember that we don't have the Passover Seder here to do that, we have prayer. That you can go with somebody who loves you and stand in the presence of God. Before we do so, I want to read one chapter of the book of Hebrews. Actually, you know what? I'm not. We'll close with this book of Hebrews. If we can get our, our music rolling, we're going to take a few minutes. We'll take, let's take five minutes and go pray with somebody. I'll be over here with my wife. You want to pray with us? But there's folks, you're surrounded by people who love you. I want to pray for you. Again, if you want to be seated, do so, but we'll start now.
folks are still praying, please continue to do so. For the rest of us, we're going to go ahead and stand. Our blessings will be a little different today. We'll read Hebrews chapter 8. Now the point in which we are saying this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne in the majesty of heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to the other gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. And they serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he instructed, was instructed by God, so that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you in the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry much more excellent than the old covenant. He mediates it better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would be no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. And it's not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I show no concern for them, declares the Lord. But for this covenant, I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And I will put my laws into their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And they shall not teach and they shall not teach each one his neighbor, each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all know me, for the least of them to the greatest. And I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And in speaking of the new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old, and it's ready to vanish. We all come from somewhere, but through Jesus we have a future. We love you all, be blessed, and we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.